Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Mo Alethi, and I am executive director of the Georgetown Institute of Politics and Public Service at the McCord School of Public Policy here. Uh, and I want to thank you all in welcoming you to tonight's uh, event, which we are very excited for. Uh, by way of background, the Institute of Politics and Public Service, or GU Politics as we call it, was founded uh, just about a year ago. Um, we're in our second year, and really with a couple of main purposes. One, to pull back the curtain and introduce the Georgetown community to politics as it's practiced, for better and for worse. Uh, and um, really to kind of introduce the community to the behind the scenes of politics and government and explore ways to make it better. The second main purpose is to really work with young people to figure that out. And so um, we're very excited about tonight's topic uh, as a perfect conversation uh, for that mission. We're thrilled tonight to be partnering with the uh, Economic Innovation Group, EIG, and Ernst & Young, EY, for this event on Millennials and the Economy, which is a central substantive issue that matters to everybody. Uh, sometimes it doesn't get the attention it deserves in this overheated political climate we're in, but it really is a central conversation. I want to particularly thank a couple of our panelists, Steve Glickman, uh, who is the EIG co-founder and executive director, and Kathy Koch, who is America's tax policy leader at EY and is on the advisory board at GU Politics. Uh, and special note, they both uh, are Hoyas. Um, both are alum, and Steve serves on the Board of Governors as well. So I want to thank you both for all of your help in pulling this event together. The timing of this conversation is very intentional. It's just before the third and final presidential debate in about 48 hours where economic issues, we hope, will get some exposure and some airtime. Um, and the issues that really matter to us, but more importantly to the millennials uh, in the room and uh, young people and students. In a moment, I'm going to invite John with EIG up to help set the stage for us, but the inspiration for this conversation was based off of a survey that EIG and EY conducted of young people, of millennials, about how they feel about various issues of the economy, surrounding the economy. Tonight, they're going to talk a little bit about some of those results. They're going to talk a little bit about how young people view the economy. Um, but it's incredibly important that we hear from you, uh, the young people that are here in the room. We want to hear your thoughts. We want to hear your reactions, your hopes, and your fears. We want to uh, connect that to what's at stake in this election. Uh, we're also excited to have Tim Miller and Simone Sanders both who played um, uh, major roles in Jeb Bush's and Bernie Sanders' presidential campaigns, two candidates who did manage to talk about these issues in meaningful ways. Uh, and we're very excited to have moderating this conversation someone who has really made a career out of being in touch with the millennial mindset, Michelle Giacconi, uh, who uh, as executive editor and now senior advisor to Independent Journal Review has really made it sort of her passion to connect the issues of the day to young people. It's an exciting panel. I'm excited to hear what they have to say. More excited to hear what you all have to say. So now I'm going to invite up John Latiri, co-founder and senior director for policy and strategy at EIG to say a few words. Thank you. Thanks. Good evening and Hoya Saxa to all of you. I don't want to crush Mo's hopes, but there's not going to be an economic policy conversation or the debate on Wednesday. That's, that's just not happening. It's not happening, Mo. Uh, so my name is John Latiri. On behalf of our uh, uh, VIG and our uh, co-partners in, uh, in this event, uh, Ian Y and uh, Georgetown Institute for Politics and Public Service, we want to thank all of you uh, for coming. As Mo mentioned, this, this event really stems from a partnership between EIG and EY on a, a national survey of millennials. And so I'm going to bring us down in mood when I report some kind of highlights from, or lowlights from the, uh, from the survey results. Uh, we, we wanted to cover everything on the economy from entrepreneurship to views on tax policy to their own personal career aspirations. And, and why? Why did this matter? It's because millennials are the largest 
the most educated and the most diverse generation in American history, so we should know what they think. And uh, our survey suggests they might also be the most angsty and skeptical in American history, uh, owing in, in large part to the ripple effects of the Great Recession and the mountain of student loan debt that so many of them have accumulated. And this really comes through in a variety of ways in the survey. In short, they're a generation that believes that the economy is failing them. And that's in spite of the fact that they're willing to work hard, they're willing to move to better opportunity, uh, they want to get an education, they've done all the right things, all the things the playbook told them to do, and they still feel like they're missing out. So our panelists are going to divide, dive deeper into those results, but because we're right in the heat of a presidential campaign, they're also going to talk about the political implications of all that. And here's a big spoiler, millennials are not huge fans of either major party. Uh, certainly compared to their parents and grandparents, they're the least politically affiliated uh, generation we have on record. Uh, and the least likely to want to identify with either, either major party's candidate. Uh, so what does that mean? Not just in 2016, but going forward to shape the political landscape. Uh, so, but as Mo said as well, following the discussion, we're going to open up to Q&A. Be thinking about your questions now. Uh, you will be judged uh, for the quality of your questions. This is a very judgmental panel, as you can tell. Uh, and our moderator is the only one who has a distinction of working for a millennial, as well as we were just talking about, so she really gets it. Uh, so with that, please join me in welcoming Alex Sideropoulos to the stage, who's a sophomore at McDonough School of Business. Thanks. Uh, good evening. As a sophomore in the McDonough School of Business, I'm honored to be able to introduce our panel tonight. Uh, so without further ado, I'll start with uh, Steve Glickman. He's a Georgetown grad, as Mo mentioned. Uh, Steve Glickman is the co-founder and executive, and executive director of the Economic Innovation Group and an adjunct assistant professor here at Georgetown University, where he teaches on economic diplomacy and international trade. For co-founding EIG, Steve served as a senior economic advisor at the White House under President Obama, special advisor to U.S. Department of Commerce, and counsel to former Congressman Henry Waxman. Next, we have Kathy Koch, who's also a uh, Georgetown grad. She's, and even more, she serves on the Geopolitics Advisory Board. Uh, she has served as America's uh, tax policy leader at Ernst Young since February of 2016. Prior to joining Ernst Young, Kathy served as Chief Policy Advisor to Senate Majority Leader for Tax and Economics. In addition to her experience on Capitol Hill, Kathy spent two years as the director of the U.S. Tax Policy for General Electric and served as dire director of global government affairs at Amgen Inc. Then we have Tim Miller, who is a partner at Definers Public Affairs, who specializes in communications and digital strategy. Miller served as the communications director for Jeb Bush 2016 uh, and was co-founder of American Rising LLC and the America Rising PAC. Uh, also, he has been one of the GOP's most visible voices uh, in the media advocating against the Trump campaign. Um, <laughs> well, next we have uh, Simone Sanders, who's a Democratic strategist uh, and CNN political commentator uh, who rose to prominence during her tenure as the National Press Secretary for the U.S. Bernie, uh, US Senator Bernie, Sand Bernie Sanders presidential campaign. Uh, in 2013, she was uh, honored as the youngest recipient ever to receive the Midlands Business Journal's uh, 40 Under 40 Award, and most recently, she was honored uh, by Fusion as one of 30 women under 30 who will influence the 2016 elections and named one of the 16 young Americans shaping the 2016 election by Rolling Stone. And last but not least, we have uh, Michelle Giacconi, another Georgetown grad. Uh, Michelle spent six years at CNN, where she founded CNN's cross-platform programming unit, leading political coverage across CNN's television networks, digital properties, and mobile apps. Prior to joining CNN, Michelle spent 12 years at NBC's Meet the Press with, Tom Russ with Tim Russert. And throughout her career, Michelle has earned multiple awards, including the Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence, um, a Peabody Award, and back-to-back -back Emmy Awards for presidential election nights. And she is also our moderator, so I'm going to turn it over to her, but I encourage all of you to get involved in the conversation and participate in the dialogue that's going on by using the hashtag MillennialEcon. Um, Without further ado, that's all. I want to start with how many of you are millennials? Raise your hands. 
Okay, great. Okay, good. Good showing. One of the most interesting things, I'm, I'm in the curiosity business as a journalist, and um, I love you all for being here because the curious solve all the world's problems, so you're here to figure that out, so thank you. Um, when you put in Google millennial, the autocomplete, like the first search is millennials in the workplace, <laughs> which is so interesting to me, one, and so it proves that this study is on point. Um, I think the thing that shocked me the most in this study, and you guys should read it because there's so many myth-busting facts in here. The first is that millennials are on path to being the least entrepreneurial generation in American history, yet they think they're the most, right? So talk to me about that, Steve. How, how is that possible? Well, first of all, let me thank George Stan for hosting. I feel very, very comfortable here in my alma mater. <laughs> um, and uh, we're, you have some of the smartest students in the country and Tim Miller here as well. So we have a really good, <laughs> good group. Before, before you get down the path, can I just say as an avid George Washington basketball booster, uh, now that I have this platform, it's shameful that you guys won't play us in basketball. Uh, it should be a nice crosstown rivalry, but I understand your fear. Are you guys, are you guys uh, in the are, same division as us? We are in the same division. Oh, okay, I wasn't aware. I thought you were double uh, A. Um, it's, not it's not important, it's not important. Um, so, Michelle, to your question, uh, not that Tim's point wasn't a good one, it was, it was a very good one. Um, I think you have to take this question and make it a little broader, which is what makes millennials unique in terms of their economic outlook and their economic reality? They're really at the tip of the spear of what's maybe a broken economy for a lot of Americans that extend beyond millennials. When they entered the workforce, for a lot of them, it was in the midst of the Great Recession. And millennial unemployment was something like 18%. And from the survey, if you ask them now what they're really worried about, nearly 80% of millennials are worried that they're going to have the, the, the types of jobs that pay the type of wages that are going to allow them to have a better um, future than, than, than their parents. They're, in fact, a majority of millennials believe that uh, they're not going to have a better financial future than, than, than their parents, which is, I would argue, both unusual and unprecedented in U.S. history. That's part of the, the story of the American dream. Each new generation gets to do better than the last. And something in that strand has broken. And it has to do, again, with these core economic facts. Millennials are the most educated generation, which should be a really good thing, right? Except they're the most indebted generation when you compare them to Gen Xers or baby boomers. And where the rubber hits the road on that is if you can't make the kind of type of wages it takes to be financially secure and you can't uh, pay back your, your debt, it, it means you, you can't take risks. And the ultimate definition of an entrepreneur is a risk taker. And they just don't feel, from the survey, millennials don't feel like they're in a position to take risks. And ultimately, what that all boils down to is they're very, uh, they lack a lot of confidence in their ability to make good wages down the road and that those jobs are gonna be there from, you know, there from them 10 years down the road. And it, it may not feel that way if you're at Georgetown in Washington, D.C., or maybe if you're in New York or San Francisco or L.A., but you go to a, a, a much of the rest of the country, and I know you've been there, Tim and Simone, and you, and you go to, you know, you're, you're in Ohio and you're sitting in Cincinnati or Cleveland or you're going, you know, out to, you know, Pennsylvania or you're, you know, you know somewhere in the Midwest that's just lost a big um, uh, employer and a lot of industrial jobs, and they're feeling very pessimistic. So you guys are really in a unique privileged position, and mu in much of the rest of the country, not just millennials, but particularly millennials, are feeling a huge amount of pessimism about their future. Yeah, and that, that was, it's so interesting in the report that I encourage you all to read, but the title is Generation Angst, right? And that angst, and Simone, I want to bring you in here because your candidate, Bernie Sanders, became synonymous with student loan debt, right? It became the most talked about and talk about taking an issue there, but so much of that angst and that this talk of fear of risk taking was because of debt. How, when you traveled the country, how did you see that, that particular issue resonate? I mean, that's what young people talk about. And, and not even just young people, people who are maybe four or five, six years removed from college, but are still paying on their student loan debts. You heard repeatedly um, the First Lady and President Obama talk about how they just paid off their student loans a couple years ago. So when we traveled the country, you know, Bernie Sanders, um, you know, our, our key talking point was we live in a rigged economy that's kept in place by a system of corrupt campaign finance. That was, that was the point. If you, if, you know, if you know nothing else, we live in a rigged economy no, kept in place by, he, he, he tried. <laughs> he attempted. He's not doing it well. Um, but that, that rigged economy plays into so many other things. And so when you talk about the fact that 
young people do have this enormous student loan debt, so they're working two, three jobs sometimes, and even sometimes they have entrepreneurial side hustles, as uh, we like to call them, where they're not fully going out into their, stepping into their entrepreneurial dreams because they can't take that risk. And so we saw many people across the country, I mean, I was just in Cleveland this past weekend and I was in Champaign, Illinois, um, the Monday after the St. Louis debate, talking with um, some students at Champaign, University of Chicago, Champaign-Urbana, Urbana-Champaign, uh, and then some young, we had a young professionals happy hour deal that I went and hosted in Cleveland this past weekend. And the conversation was about, okay, great, we understand, you know, the, many of the people in the room were not voting for Donald Trump, but they were like, what is so special about Secretary Clinton, the issues that I care about? And I was like, well, what are your issues? Because I travel and people want to tell me what the millennial issues are and tell me what your issues are. And folks were like, we care about jobs. We care about the economy. I want to know about taxes. And I was like, the mainstream media does not think y'all care about taxes. <laughs> but that is, that is the issue that um, millennials care about. And these are the conversations that they're having in their communities. And I mean, they're, they're doing fundraisers, they're raising, they're raising awareness around not just student loan debt and robust student loan repayment options, but what does this mean for the economy? Millennials have families. I think a lot of times people think of millennials and they think of college students. And the millennials are 18 to 34, sometimes 35 in some polls and some surveys. So for those folks that are 24 plus that maybe have a family, people have two kids, they're working two, three jobs, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, and they don't make enough food, money to put food on the table for their families, those folks want to know about the intricate issues of the economy. So I, uh, I think a lot of times we're missing the conversation when it comes to millennials. I think, again, as a person with student loans, uh, <laughs> Sally Mae is probably going to come find me right after this panel. Yeah. <laughs> I, I identify with the need for robust student loan repayment options. Yeah. But I also know that I went to a good school, got a really expensive education, and when I got out of school, somebody wanted to pay me $40,000 a year when I have an education well valued over $120,000. So I just, these are issues that young people in this room are facing and dealing with right now, but young people outside of this room. So I think that's the kind of conversation we need to be having. Yeah. yeah. Tim? Yeah. No, I, I want to bring in Tim here because you working for Jeb Bush, he try, tried to bring up this issue. And so I want to get to that fact that a lot of this is not known. Like, it, it, you're reading this whole study saying, why are we not talking? We're talking here, and the conversation, the facts are here. And how frustrating was that? Well, it was really frustrating. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, I mean, you can't just sit around and complain about that. Uh, Michael Steele is out there, and he worked on a lot of boring stuff that you guys never read uh, <laughs> that we did our very best to get you to read. Uh, would have helped. I read it, Michael. <laughs> uh, wasn't it great? Uh, yeah, it was engaging. Um, yeah. So here's the thing. Uh, after Jeb, um, you know, I went, I did, I went and helped the college Republicans on a project looking at, you know, what can Republicans do uh, to do better with young voters because because we're doing, you know, so horribly. And um, obviously, Donald Trump uh, is like the worst possible thing that we could do <laughs> to uh, reach young voters. But it was interesting. Uh, we did research on the student loan issue, and a lot of these young voters liked what Bernie Sanders was doing mostly because he demonstrated that he cared about them and that, that he was listening to them um, and that he wanted to you know, come up with solutions for the problems that face them. Not all of them, you know, contrary to popular opinion, were you know, democratic socialists who were you know, on board with necessarily free college or, or, the, uh, or necessarily the government uh, solution to this. A lot of young voters have now grown up in a world where they haven't seen the government do anything well. For the past for the past decade, nothing the government's done has worked for them, so they're skeptical. But what they want, what they were not getting from Republicans was any alternate solution. Bernie was the only one out there offering a solution to them. And so, you know, when we tested talking to them about other ways to reform uh, uh, student loans, other way, you know, giving people different options to pay off their student loans, figuring out other ways to get the cost of college done, a lot of students were open to that. And frankly, a lot of the younger voters, uh, and not students, we tested all the way up to their 20s, didn't even believe that Bernie would be able to get done the free college, but they liked like that it was going to be a priority. Tuition free, yeah. tuition free college. Right. Yeah. So what's the difference tuition between that and free, free college? Tuition. Mm -hmm. There are other costs associated with uh, oh. college outside of tuition. Oh, that's, that's nice. People got to pay for something. <laughs> <laughs> bring up a good point. I'm going to bring Kathy in here, too, because the, the, what's interesting about this survey is it shows that millennials as a generation are overly patriotic. They love their country, even though, to your point, Tim, in your view, they haven't seen government work. But what's interesting is that, that 
patriotism is over-indexed, but their partisanship is under-indexed, meaning that they don't see either party speaking to them. And it was interesting to me, even during Ivanka Trump's speech at the convention, she says, neither party has spoken to me like a millennial, right? Instantly, everyone on Twitter is like, you're a Democrat, you're a Republican. I'm like, what is Washington's problem with they can't accept that, right? And, and I've heard a lot of people that they, when you get out of this town, that they're, that they're fearful of both parties, right? They, they kind of take things based on personality and gut and truth. Yeah, and so, so my know. question, and, and my question is, is that, is that true? And how, how do, how, walk us through that data of saying basically, I, I love my country, mm. I want a solution, I want somebody to show me a solution and believe that they care, believe that they talk about things that, that I care about, but in a way that isn't necessarily reflexively partisan. I don't think they're thinking in a partisan fashion when they say, I need some, something done about my student loan debt. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're, they're not thinking, oh man, I really want you know, Donald Trump or Jeb Bush to win, and, you know, but I like student debt. I, I think they're looking at their kind of the boots on the ground experience that they're having and they're saying, this isn't working, I need a solution, I don't care who comes up with it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they are, they're overwhelmingly patriotic. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, you know, one of my favorite headlines was, you know, millennials hate everything except America. <laughs> you know, and that was kind of my favorite. And actually, Hispanic men polled highest on patriotism, which yeah. was kind of funny for your friend who's yeah. running, yeah. Um, and, yeah. or your boss should be. But, um, <laughs> you know, this, I, I don't, just don't think yeah. they're thinking about politics the way that perhaps those of us who live and work in this town thought about politics. They want, to like this country, they want to believe in this country. They believe, you know. In fact, interestingly, when it comes to um, institutions, they believe in the military, which Steve tells me is actually a long-standing kind of trend that that people trust the military. Second, and they're right there with them. Second, they trust educational institutions. You know, they, and yet, in, uh, you know, an interesting thing about the student loan debt and the, the education thing. This is, you know, the largest investment you guys are probably made up to this point in your life, and over 50% of millennials wonder whether it was worth it. It's the most educated generation. Everyone's doing it. You're doing it. It's important to do it. Everyone understands that to get ahead, you have to work hard. You have to get an education. But then in the end, like in the back of their mind, they're like, hmm, I wonder what the return on this investment is. And that's, that's staggering, Stephen, the report to basically say this generation is the most educated and the least paid, right? most unemployed that that is so just to see it starkly written like that that's that's frightening and one of the things that interested me a lot was the you know politics the study of politics is the study of demographics right and so if you look at the demographics of the study what's fascinating to me was that african american women were the ones that were most that thought that the answer to the question how do i get ahead starting my own business they index the highest which I thought was neat, right? And then it was, it was, I also thought it was interesting that a lot of people still overwhelmingly in this generation said, I want to stay the course at one company, right? And that, that's where the discrepancy, and, and that seemed really strange to me, and you know this better than I do. Well, it's one of the counterintuitive um, yeah. mm -hmm. set of findings. If you look at the findings, the, the group in, uh, among millennials are the, the most pessimistic, both about their future, the country's direction, uh, institutions are white women the most pessimistic by, by a mile. In general, whites are less confident in uh, institutions than, um, than black millennials were and uh, Hispanic millennials. Black women tend to be the most um, confident in, in institutions, the most uh, optimistic about their future, and the most likely to want to be entrepreneurs. Of course, it doesn't match up with the, the conventional wisdom of what's happening in the country right now, and some of it has to do with sort of the trajectory that a lot of uh, African Americans, at least in this poll, found themselves uh, in compared to uh, maybe where white Americans see themselves. But it's also, if you look at how difficult it is to become an entrepreneur, and this is one of the great crises in the country, it is much harder to become an entrepreneur if you're a woman than if you're a man, if you're a minority than if you're white, much harder to raise capital, much, much harder to get venture capital, uh, even though, for instance, women entrepreneurs tend to be much more successful founders of companies than, than, than male entrepreneurs tend to be. Uh, so there, there are some very interesting counterintuitive vibes, but I think the overarching issue with, that we should all be concerned about is although black women say they're much more likely to want to be black millennial women, much more likely to want to be entrepreneurs, there is still this huge obstacle that are pre preventing millennials of all types from 
from pursuing entrepreneurship, less than 3% of millennials, this is a big age group, 18 to the 34 in our study, are connected with entrepreneurship at all, less than 3%. That is not the conventional wisdom in this country of who's starting and running country, uh, companies. Uh, the Mark Zuckerberg model, and as great of a company as Facebook has been, is a, a rare oddity. It's the white whale of entrepreneurship. And it relates to these bigger issues. I, I, I want to talk real, real briefly to, to Kathy's point, to the question about political affiliation among millennials. Uh, something like, I think, 27% of millennials identified as Democrats, 17% of Republicans. Not great for either party, a little better for Democrats. I'm nonpartisan despite the Sox. Uh, <laughs> but that means a majority of millennials don't identify with either party. And this is a problem both parties have to, have to you know, deal with over the next several years or so. And I would argue that another big trend you're seeing right now in the election is you see uh, Democrats are much more likely to embrace optimism, Republicans much more likely to embrace pessimism, but this is a fundamentally a pessimistic generation. Mm -hmm. It's a big break. They're really concerned about their future. And if that's the case, I, I, I think the millennial generation is up for grabs. Whatever party can talk about real issues impacting them, and that means they're not talking about the minimum wage, honestly. They're not talking about tax cuts. They're talking about who's going to provide me good jobs. How am I going to get to a place where I can afford to get married, buy a house, move out from my parents? I'm, I'm sure no one here is living with their parents, probably living on campus somewhere. I was a Henley alum myself. It's a, it's a great on-campus apartment. But 40% of uh, millennials are, li are living at home. If you're, if you're single and you're a millennial, you're likely to be you know, living at home, a plurality of them. So the, the trend lines are, are pretty dramatic here. And what, what makes it interesting is at the, the tip of the spear of the economy. They're going to be the next business owners and consumers and employees, and they don't have a lot of confidence in their future, and the parties have to find a way to address it. Both of them do. Okay, so let me, so just yeah. one point about entrepreneurship is that, you know, when you do see depressed entrepreneurship, you're going to see, you know, the kind of impact of that is going to roll out over the future. We see really tight correlations between uh, startups and job creation, startups and economic growth. If, if we have kind of a decline in startups kind of approaching the data bubble, we might, you know, logically expect then a decline in jobs creation and, and a decline in growth. We need to get this back on track. And, you know, you get it back on track, you make millennials more optimistic, you make better things for the economy. You know, we have, we have kind of a cat by the tail and we need to control it, I think. So, okay, Simone and Tim are operators here. We have a debate on Wednesday in Las Vegas, a city hard hit by the recession. If you were to advise the candidate, Tim, I know that you don't really want to talk Which to one? Trump, but oh, let's just advisor. say, <laughs> okay, let's say, uh, <laughs> Evan McMullen, uh, yes, yes, okay. talk to that candidate. What would, what, what would you advise him to say to reach this generation? I, I don't want to duck your question, but like, there's nothing that Trump can do. I mean, it, you know, he honestly is a total lost cause. Um, so it, like, it doesn't really, the, I, I, like, without, I, I'm going to put a different question in your mouth. Like, what do you say to, like, Mitch McConnell or Paul Ryan? Like, what are these, you know, what are these guys going to have to do? And that is, um, you know, Republicans need to make the case to younger voters that we want to help create more opportunity for them from the bottom up and not be the party that is in the pocket of, the big bankers and the big existing businesses and the big incumbents. And that's what we need to do differently because that's what millennials want and, a, and it has the benefit of being what the economy needs too. They don't have trust, any confidence in these, in these big institutions or big, big companies to, um, to, be a sol to be a solution for them. And so you know, what they need is a government that's more responsive to them. There are not a lot of Republicans out there that are talking about that. I mean, I just sat here, you, know, you went on a very nice five minute riff about the importance of entrepreneurship. You said the word entrepreneur more times than either of our two presidential candidates have, probably in the entire campaign. I'm, I'm not sure Donald Trump has ever used that term. Um, unless he was talking about well, himself. Yes. Um, <laughs> and Hillary, obviously, it's not in, on the top of her priority list. How much is it, before I bring in Simone, I want to stand to him for one second because you mentioned Paul Ryan and McConnell. How much, if we've seen, like, you know, the Catholic Church or these institutions that were really hurt with trust and angst and then have a transformational figure like Pope Francis come, right? And how much is it recruiting a next generation candidate for? this party that is a transformational figure that might speak millennial? Uh, I mean, it's absolutely critical. Uh, there's not, uh, you know, people, there's a big debate within our party about what happens after this election. How do we 
fix it going forward. And one camp has a lot of people that I like in it think that the problem with Donald Trump was we let too many of these outsiders come into our party primaries this time. And like too many people that were, that were not rank and file Republicans came in and supported Donald Trump. And so we need to close down the primary system and only let- election suppression, ladies and, and gentlemen. Only let, election suppression. Yeah, and only let Republican rank and file voters mm -hmm. come. That when that is totally the wrong thing to do, right? What, what the party needs is a millennial Trump, mm -hmm. honestly. What the party needs is a, is, a, is a candidate who can run in 2020 or 2024 that can appeal to young voters and minorities, or else we're never, we're never gonna be able to win an election, a national election again. Uh, we're gonna become a regional party. So I, I, do, I, I do think that's a, an important thing, but it's a white whale right now, and that the person doesn't exist, and so. Unless they're in this room, so keep thinking. Okay, <laughs> Simone. So my well, my free you. advice to the Republican Party is that they have to one find out who they exactly are, and so you can't identify who your millennial person is or what your party is doing unless you know who you are and what you stand for and what the core values are. And the Republican Party had this really informational autopsy report following um, 2012, and there were lots of new people that were brought into the party, people that no longer worked there since the rise of Donald Trump. And it is a focus on the issues. 46% of millennials across the board identify as independents. And so I think that's an opportunity for both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party because that's an opportunity to talk about the issues. Folks always want to ask, why was Bernie Sanders so successful? Because Bernie Sanders talked about the issues. Whatever your issue was, Bernie had an issue for it, and he, he had a policy platform, and he talked about it every single place he went. You went to a Bernie rally for an hour and 15 minutes, you got policy. If you cared about criminal justice reform, climate change, the economy, whatever, health care, he talked about it. I thought it, it was the bird. Now, <laughs> the bird came later. The bird came later. Now, it can, there can be an argument on whether um, those policies were feasible or you know what it would take to get there, but the fact of the matter is millennials want to at least know that you're talking about their issues and that you at least have have a plan to put on the table. So to your question as to what the candidates need to do Wednesday night and what Secretary Clinton needs to do, Secretary Clinton, even though folks, young uh, millennials aren't going out to be entrepreneurs because they're risk adverse, they want to hear your plan for entrepreneurship. And Secretary Clinton has a plan for that that many people don't necessarily know about. They want to know what your plan is um, to, again, help people put more money in their pockets, to put more food on their tables. And we haven't heard a lot of that in this election, I think the most policy substantive conversation we had was around immigration reform and whether, you know, Donald Trump and his wall. And that was, that was great for like a little bit of time, but millennials want to talk about the issues. Regardless of how, where, whatever side they stand on, they want to have a substantive conversation and they're turned off. I hear from people traveling all the time that, you know, they don't want to hear that Donald Trump's a bigot or he's a racist or that Hillary Clinton is a liar or, you know, these emails. They want to talk about the actual issues, and because that has not been the forefront of the general election campaign, people have been turned off and they're tuned out, and that is why um, there's a chance that the millennial turnout won't be what folks are looking for come November 8th. Mm -hmm. Could I channel my, my inner Republican for a second, which is that I normally suppress that, that, that part of me deeply, but uh, just, just for a second. The entrepreneurship Chair. speech you gave was really good. That could have been <laughs> Paul Ryan. That was nice. Well, I, I, the, you had me confused there for a well, second. Well, I think the point is that could be a big chunk of members on both sides in the middle. There are The, the real like hidden secret of D.C. is that the, the, the cable news doesn't really do justice to the fact that there is a critical mass of members who come to this town to do the right things and are willing to work together on stuff, just not in public. <laughs> and, I, well, I, and, and, and that's true. And and Democrats have a. I know we talk about Republicans that have a huge problem because you know Trump is a historically bad candidate. But there are lots of uh, reasons that Democrats shouldn't sit on their haunches after this election. Just repeating an earlier stat: just barely one in four millennials consider themselves Democrats. That is a not a good statistic for Democrats. And if you look at Congress right now, there are a far more, something like 50% more young Republican members, and now there are more Republicans in Congress, but young Republican members and Democrats. Millennials are not engaging in public service. They're not running for office as Democrats. There is a far more, far bigger bench in the Republican Party. They control more governorships, more state legislatures. I, I have hope that the Republican Party can get their act together, and I have hope the Democratic Party can. But this notion of like the elections are fundamentally about Republicans versus Democrats is an outdated version of our politics. Yeah. There's two real big battles happening right now. One, this is really a battle about pragmatists, doers, and populists. And, and there's nothing wrong with populism per se, but you have to channel it into what can you do 
constructively as a government. And that battle is, we'll see how that resolves. And the second big battle is there's a big battle in geography in this country. There's a battle between cities that are doing really well economically and parts of the country, both cities and rural areas that aren't. And if we don't address that core issue about the country, we're going to continue pulling apart. And that is a really bad thing for America. It's a bad thing for the rest of the world. We're not the only country that's dealing with populism. Almost every Western economy is dealing with populism. People are fundamentally unhappy with the state of affairs looking at uh, how things are, are after the recession. And the U.S. did better than any other country in that regard. And politically, everyone is hurting because at the, at the end of the day, the parties are not talking about, this is, I think, the key theme from everyone. They're not really talking about the issues that matter. This election is going to hurt both parties because it delegitimizes I think, government. I think that Hillary, I wouldn't give Trump advice, so I'll give Hillary a little bit of advice, but I, I think that she did. She told her, me to ask you for your advice. Right. Uh, she did at her convention, I think, a very nice job of, reach, of, of reaching out to disaffected Republicans. Just going at your divide really quick, the rural, uneducated Republican class is, is not within reach for Hillary, right? So she doesn't even have to think about. So we'll just put that, that, that demographic over here for a little bit. But the college educated and younger Republican class, she did a nice job at the convention of reaching out to them by talking about uh, you know, support for the military, you know, the con speech by, by, uh, by pointing out Trump's extremism on issues, uh, you know, particularly on immigration and other issues. She could on Wednesday, I, I think, do a lot to assuage a lot of college educated and younger Republican voters who are looking at, who just hate her and are looking at Trump and think, oh, I, I, I cannot pull the, I cannot pull the lever for this guy if she focuses probably not on issues that Simone likes, <laughs> but you know, if she does focus on the economic growth issues and job issues, um, which and, I and, 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 and talks more to and talks more to that audience, but then she's going to have her own problem on with the Bernie crowd. But they're all going to vote for her this time anyway. So during the primary, Bernie Sanders got dinged because they said he was a one-issue candidate, and they said he always came out talking about jobs and. What about people of color and so on and so forth? Jobs is a black, brown, white, Asian American, Native American, and otherwise issue. Everybody cares about jobs. That's true. Everyone is feeling the, the, the economic hurt. You know, when we talk about the wealth gap in this country mm -hmm. and the fact that for the last 50 years, the wealthiest of wealthy Americans have garnered additional wealth where the middle class has stayed stagnant and the, pe the poorest people have become poor. That is a real issue and that's something people are talking about. Just yesterday, I was having a conversation with folks and they were like, well, why should I vote? And I'm like, I went to my little spiel, all these things are on the ballot, whatever your issue is that you care about, it's on the ballot. And they were like, well, what about people who aren't necessarily, you know, tuned in, professional political people, but, you know, they're, they're feeling these real economic hurts. And they started talking about the fact that people that, you know, do work two or three jobs, they, dis they don't necessarily have the, the luxury of taking off work to go stand in line for an hour, hour and a half, maybe only 30 minutes this election, I hope it's longer, um, to go vote. And you have to give them a reason why. And they do not feel that this system is directly connected to the betterment of their lives. And so that is the conversation the Republican Party and the Democratic Party is, I, I know the Democrats are currently having that conversation, but we have to have it post November 8th. And I think that's where the economy tip it's extremely important and it goes long beyond this conversation. So on Wednesday, if Hillary Clinton wants to talk about the economy, she can reach some of those white working class Republicans, she can reach some educated Republicans, but she can also reach some disaffected people of the Democratic base that do not feel this economy is working for them. I need to introduce you to some white working class Republicans. I know I don't, some. I don't think she's going to win. I know I some. Think she's I know some, and they vote for she, Hillary Clinton. I think, I think she yeah. can focus on getting people to not to, uh, to spend an hour off their off their two jobs to go vote on November eighth by trying to convince them not to support a totalitarian maniac <laughs> who hates them. So one more That's, point that I'll give you. That, your I probably just that. focus on that. But the millennials. So to this point about millennials, and I I didn't I didn't see this point in the data, but maybe it's in there. But the point about Donald Trump being such a bad man and that is why you should go to the polls, that doesn't work for young people. Mm -hmm. Young people, I don't think, are scared of Donald Trump. Yeah, I don't think they're tuned into that. I think the issues for young people and the be. old people are much different than, you know, she was part of something that we didn't like before and he's this scary person. They're thinking, you know, when I think about what we even thought about in Congress, you know, traditional Republicans v. traditional Democrats, they weren't issues like student debt and, you know, are you living with your parents and 
are you in a recession? Even we kind of lived in international tax reform and all kinds of older people stuff. And we are forgetting that this new wave is coming up. It's the largest generation, and we better start paying attention to it yeah. on, on both sides. And another you know, interesting thing about these disaffected generations, because we have left a generation behind, and they are, I think, Trump supporters. You know, when we have economic or, you know, kind of turnover, we leave. The people that get the new jobs aren't the people that lost the old jobs. And we have, mm -hmm. I yeah. think, paid very poor attention to those left behind generations again and again and again. And this one is pissed. And, you know, I remember from Harry Reid's office, when we used to talk about, um, you know, the recovery, we used to get things from the pollsters, like, no one thinks we're in recovery, so stop saying that, because <laughs> as soon as you talk about recovery, people think you're out of touch. And we were actually in a kind of in a recovery, statistically, economically. But even in our poll, 30% of our respondents think their community is still in recession. So that's either a geographical difference, which I guess it's both a geographical difference, but it's also you know kind of my personal experience versus what you're saying. And I don't care what you're saying. Like I don't, you know, what I care about is is what I wake up to every day. And that's a, a bipartisan or a nonpartisan issue. And we. I think at the upper levels or the grown up, you know, like the older, the silverbacks, they don't, they haven't tuned into that yet. No, and I think it's interesting translating that patriotism into public service, right? Which is why I believe in this place so much and why I want your questions. So I'm going to come to you. To, if, does anybody have a question now? Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. Oh, here. Oh, sorry. I sprang that on them. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Going back a few years, back to when I was an undergrad, which was pre-2008, I am a millennial, but pre-2008, they told you student debt was a good thing. You'd never be able to borrow money this cheaply. It would not impact your ability to do things and to function because it was cheap money. You had a long time to pay it back. There was no, it was like it was a muni bond for, for people. That it was, you know, something you could pay back over time and it was not something to be super concerned about after the crisis, all of a sudden, that flips. And suddenly, people of my generation who got good jobs couldn't get apartments. Because when you filed your financial statements, all of a sudden, people saw, whoa, you have $100,000 in student debt. That gets priority over everything. We won't give you an apartment. We won't give you a car. So for all the talk about entrepreneurship, I feel like what gets left out is the larger discussion about the change in the view of debt. Uh, even though government borrowing fell to a super, super low amount, people were talking, making a big issue about the, the foreign debt, the federal deficit. It, you know, the, the student debt being an issue, but it's not just paying back the loans, it's also getting your life going becomes very impaired. Whereas pre-2008, the advice you were getting was don't worry about it. And it, you know, that is such a great point. And even you just telling that story and saying, here, I couldn't get this apartment from your perspective, that would be great public service journalism. And I'm serious because most journalists are, you know, either laid off or not, <laughs> not millennials, right? And so doing that kind of thing, it's economic literacy, right? And it's something that nobody's talking about. The people that are in this position to lend money, frankly, are not in your shoes. Right? And so that's where I truly think that some, like the, what's interesting being from the media side is that what is resonating and, and you know, I left CNN to go work for a millennial and with millennials and what's interesting is how much of that first person storytelling goes viral, right? Those are the pieces. I am a millennial, I have a great job and a great education and I wasn't allowed to rent a car or get an apartment because of this, right? That story would be shared and educate so many people and so that's just something, I, I applaud you for even sharing that much in a question like this, but, but also just to encourage you to talk about that because you know, the, those are the type of things that people, it, it means so much more when it's somebody actually was affected by it. Let's look at the yeah. parallels between that and the mortgage debt crisis. Yeah. I mean, what you said, I could have substituted the word house in there exactly. right around the crisis time. You know, people told me to get a house. They told me it was a good investment. We, as a social policy, pushed homeowning because it was good for neighborhoods. We made, you know, mortgages cheap. Get it. It's so cheap. You know, it's the cheapest possible debt you ever had. Whoops. You know, and then all of a sudden it, it cratered people's lives. And interestingly, I think when we tell that story and we told that story over and over again, and people, families that were moved out, and they pushed, you know, congressional action to solutions that I, I hope were at least partially, you know, effective. 
But that, you know, I wonder, is the student loan debt going to become crisis enough to elicit a similar kind of crisis response? In Congress, we, we respond to crises. That's kind of what we do. That's what um, Washington acts. So, yeah, well, there, and there are, yeah. exa well, that's true. Washington does act, and then there are two problems there with like what you're, you know, talking about. There is, you know, um, that, that have solutions kind of on both sides of the aisle, but we aren't dealing with either of them. There's, you know, the, uh, the student loan debt you know, issue and that you have, and we have to deal with that so that uh, young people don't have this crushing debt that doesn't allow them to, you know, go out and do all the other things. We also have regulations where some of the well-intended regulations that Senator Reid put through <laughs> now make it harder for people to loan, right? To, to, to or harder for banks that, that are, that are um, incentivizing, disincentivizing you know, banks from, you know, loaning people who want, who want to be on, making loans to people who want to be entrepreneurs, but, you know, are saddled with all this other debt. Um, so, you know, we, we need to come up with solutions that both, you know, that, uh, you know, gets government uh, 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 creating positive, you know, results rather than having negative results. And I, I would argue there's a, a, also a bigger related issue. One, the issue of student debt as a standalone issue is substantially more severe now than it has been for past generations, by, mm -hmm. by almost double. Mm -hmm. There's just 80 to 90 percent more student borrowers, there are 80 to 90 percent higher student debt burdens. I mean, it's a big difference, but there's a bigger crisis. I think this is one Tim is going to, although I'm not sure I diagnosed the problem in exactly the same way, although that's part of the problem. There's an access to capital crisis in this country. Mm -hmm. Capital markets are broken for people who are not in the elite, who are not elite companies or who are not wealthy folks. It's hard to get capital if you're a small company. Small business lending is on a huge, huge decline from, from big companies. Small banks, which used to fund a lot of these smaller businesses, a huge percentage of them, somewhere between 25% and 35% went out of business over the last seven years or so. And venture capital is very isolated. If, you know, this growth capital that you read about and see about that these companies are getting these huge rounds of funding, 80% uh, of it nearly is in just three states, California, Massachusetts, and New York. So there's a big access to capital crisis in this country, and it impacts, at the end of the day, people who are most vulnerable. If you've got a lot of student debt, if your credit rating isn't great because you haven't had credit in a long time, also something that young people are disproportionately impacted by. If you're carrying credit card debt and a mortgage and student loan debt, it is really tough for you to do things like start businesses or just get, get you know, pay the next paycheck. And this is one of the things that came out in the polls. Close to two thirds of millennials are concerned about paying a $500 debt. A sudden $500 debt would be catastrophic to two thirds of millennials. That's a bad place for this country to be. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why it's so catastrophic is they know there's nowhere for them to go. People that they would borrow from, friends and family, they don't have resources either. Their mortgages are also underwater. So what it shows is the ripple effects of an economy where only a, some segment of our, of our population and our communities have recovered has huge dispro you know, disproportionate impact on Areas that you know you can't you can't uh, anticipate, like young people being able to do uh, feel like they can do more things with their life because they're trapped in the same uneven recovery that, that we're all trapped in. And Tim, I think you highlighted a good point, and Simone, you're talking about it as well, which is this core question of opportunity. There's still a core belief among most people that this is a country of opportunity, but the the economic reality is much darker than that, and millennials are feeling it first. And there's a big percentage that aren't feeling like those opportunities are going to be there for them anymore. And unless we can address that core issue, and both Republicans and Democrats should be able to talk about opportunity in a better way, neither one of them are going to be able to get the vote of millennials, in my view. I think it's become a question of opportunity for who. So it, whether we're talking about young people, men, women, African Americans, Latinos, so on and so forth. Um, and to your question, Bernie Sanders would say, and he has said, we need to get the federal government out of profiting from student loans. I remember when I was in school, um, I started college in 2008, and partway through my education, Wells Fargo was my loan company, and then it became the Department of Education. And uh, rates got a little bit higher. So I think those are things, real things that everybody can grapple with and people are feeling. Mm -hmm. It also suggests that like, a solution for this problem, you know, as much of a problem as it's causing, a solution could unlock a lot of things downstream. Yeah. You know, there is a kind of a silver bullet here, which is if we could find it or a silver lining, it, it would have a chain impact that would be far-reaching, just as the problem is having negative impacts way down chain. Mm -hmm. So it's so worth spending time on. Thank you. Did we answer your question? Okay. 
<laughs> Anybody follow up? Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Or, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Glickman, earlier you mentioned the pragmatist versus populist dynamic, and Ms. Sanders obviously worked for a very populist candidate, so I'd be a bit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd be particularly interested to hear both of your perspectives on this. Um, I liked a lot of the stuff Bernie said during the primary, but ultimately I was concerned about whether or not he could actually get it done and wound up supporting Hillary for that reason, because I thought she, even if in a more incremental way, might move the country in uh, the right direction. So to what extent do you think a, a populist president would have differed, like Bernie Sanders would differ greatly from a pragmatic president like Hillary Clinton. And secondly, do you think a populist president like Bernie would have some incentive to compromise to pass legislation? So I think that, well, I believe, I believe in thinking big. So I just want to put that out there. I believe we can think big. I think all, everything, great things have happened in this country from thinking big and not waiting for incremental change. You know, if we waited for incremental change, we'd still be sitting at segregated lunch counters. But I say all that to say that a lot of people felt like you did. They really loved what Bernie was talking about, but they were like, I don't know if he can get it done. I think had, had Bernie, you know, had we gone through and Bernie Sanders would have been the Democratic nominee and um, say he got elected president, I think he would have still felt populist, but he would have became a little bit more pragmatic because that's just how it works. I think we would have swamped you in 2018 and then nothing would have happened for two years. But I think that people, so, who, so let's take... Make public college and universities tuition free, for example, not free, but tuition free. That is a controversial topic for some people, but there's some I middle ground. I don't understand the distinction. What's the difference? There are other, did you pay for school? There are other fees associated with the like collegiate books? education. Like yes, like books, there are technology fees, there are other things, there's things past tuition. Okay. So there are young people in this country that can get their tuition covered, but they still can't pay for the other things that have to go along with their yeah. collegiate education. So. I say all that to say it's a controversial topic, but I think there's some middle ground somewhere. So who's to say that a president Bernie Sanders couldn't have found middle ground? You know, Hillary Clinton has taken on pieces of Bernie Sanders, you know, college platform, if you will. So I do think that there are ways to marry the two, but I think people are very, I mean, just young people, the polls say we're risk averse. That plays into our politics as well. It, it, I'm, not, I'm not convinced you have, to, you have to do one or the other. I think you have to, what Bernie Sanders and arguably someone else who wasn't Donald Trump, who wasn't doing that sort of, and saying the sort of insane things that Donald Trump is saying, but a, president, a, a presidential candidate who is tapping into the fundamental concerns coming out of blue collar, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, middle class, kind of the Rust Belt America, mm -hmm. there are real legitimate issues that both that Sanders and someone not Trump could have tapped into that, that, that the establishment figures in both parties weren't. You need to be able to talk, you need to be able to diagnose what the real problems are in this country and speak to them. And, and you know, Bernie Sanders, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with his ultimate solutions, he tapped into something visceral, which is that college education is too expensive. I have too much debt and it's not fair because all I'm trying to do is better myself, take a new job and, you know, grow the economy and I'm doing my part. Why is this so difficult? And that is a legit gripe to have that parties ought to respond to. It's also legit to say that over the last 20 years of talking about globalization, all I know is that the manufacturers in my city have left. Those jobs seem to be somewhere else and there's no adequate workforce training or investments coming to my community that, sh that show what the jobs of the future are gonna look like here. I may see them in San Francisco, but I don't see them here in Cleveland. They're not here. Those are legit issues and you can recognize and talk about those issues and still at the end of the day be able to craft a set of policies that both parties can get to. You talked about entrepreneurship being an issue that Paul Ryan would care about. Entrepreneurship is an issue that Democrats and Republicans both can and do care about. They're not owned by either party. They ought to be talked about by both parties. But we spend so much time in this lens of being partisan and tribalistic that ultimately we're doing a disservice to what people really want. And I believe the parties are getting punished for it. Right now we're all getting punished for it. I can barely watch. Can I be the, can I be the tribalistic <laughs> rain cloud yeah. over here? You can. Um, you can. I, I, I think you probably should just let your freak flag fly with Bernie, man, because I don't, um, I, 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 we, the populists are taking over our party right now, and they're going to have a, a lot of power in Congress, and I just don't, I, I don't see a whole lot of, you know, kind of bipartisan accomplishment happening in this town over the next four years, um, and it's possible that Hillary uh, will be able to win enough of a landslide because Trump is so bad. Um, to take the house, but I, I think it's probably it's unlikely, you know. And so um, 
and we'll probably do well in the midterms again. So, you know, I, I think that right now we're, uh, I have a, I'm very optimistic about, um, you know, the future of the country. And I think that, you know, I think that millennials are kind of unnecessarily uh, pessimistic about, you know, the slow recovery that the economy is making. And, you know, I, I think a lot of the ben benefits that are coming from, from techno technological change, but, I'm not, I'm extreme, I think they're right to be extremely pessimistic about Washington. And I, I don't know that, uh, I, I think that the populist surge in the Republican Party is not going to disappear after Trump goes away. And I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on the types of people in our party who would make deals with Democrats. Uh, there's going to be a lot of bad incentives to encourage them to not do that from the conservative media and from grassroots. Uh, it's going to make it really hard for people to cut deals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People that have cut yeah. deals, really good deals in the past, yeah. Yeah. are now facing, I think, jeopardy. Sorry, man. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you all, first of all. Um, I'm a huge advocate in investing in education, so I think that's very important. But I, I wanted to ask, what role do you think the federal government really has in combating student loan, uh, student debt crisis? Because couldn't you attribute the student debt crisis to the disinvestment from state governments in public education? That's a really great question. Yeah, I mean, I know that when I worked up there, there's always kind of a tension between, you know, what we funded mm -hmm. and, you know, were we carrying, you know, state governments? And, you know, uh, I have heard people say, you know, well, the governor's need to do it themselves. Let them raise taxes at a local level and pay for X, Y, Z. You know, we can't, there's always a tension between doing something federally and then kind of funding your state. And, um, you know, it may be that there's been, as state budgets face terrific deficits over, you know, since the recession, the federal government has to chip in more and, and things just move over to where the services are. And that could be, but we still need to address the crisis, and we and federal government leadership is, I think, where it comes. It's the only, uh, this is my personal opinion, fair way to do it because when you have kind of a block grant kind of mentality where different states handle it on their own, you end up with some very uneven results that tend to exacerbate geographical economic differences. So, it yeah. may be. As the token Republican here, I'm going to have to uh, throw a wrench. I'm going to throw a wrench. I'm going to have to throw a wrench in the progress here. I, I don't, I think the federal government is the problem right now with, with college education <laughs> costs going up. If you look at inflation in every other aspect of the economy except for healthcare and education, it's going like this. And in healthcare and education, it's going like that. And one thing that healthcare and education have in, in common is that the government's going to pay for it no matter what. And so gov the government has, I said a lot of my Republican Friends have bad incentives coming from uh, the conservative media to get them to behave badly. The government is creating a lot of bad incentives for universities to not to not check, uh, you know, the increase in tuition because universities can increase their tuition 20% every year, and the government says, ah, well, we'll still give people cheap loans to go there. It doesn't matter, and and uh, and so you know there is there right now unless you federalize the university system and create, you know, artificial, you know, uh, an artificial ceiling on it that way, you know, I think that the student loan program is actually, you know, creating more problems. Uh, the, federal, the, the federal government taking over the student loan problem is taking more problems. So I'm sure well, there are a lot well, of... Well, how would you fix it? As the token Republican, how would you fix it? I think he was advocating for federalizing it. That's yeah, what I heard. That was I just want to get you, you on right. You said record. unless you federalize it, it's all broken. So that would lead you to believe you should federalize it, right, Tim? Uh, that is, I do not believe you should federalize uh, it. But I do... Just I, I took the wrong... I actually, I actually, well, I actually do, though, think... And this is true in healthcare, too. We're kind of going off uh, down a crazy path here. But I do think that completely federalizing is better than the kind of Frankenstein, you know, system that we have now, which takes Someone the worst. Someone should definitely tweet that out. Which takes, which takes, <laughs> the, worst, tweet which takes the worst out of both worlds. <laughs> but um, uh, what I would do is I would um, federalize it for low-income uh, uh, students that can't afford to pay college, and I would make uh, middle-class and upper-middle-class uh, uh, individuals actually have to go get loans in the real market. But, but, but I'd like to say, you, you just, you, 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 earlier you were arguing how pessimistic you were about the parties being able to find some kind of compromise. I don't know if that's where 
the parties will end up. But that is a solution. Yeah. They live somewhere in the middle of where both parties are. I'm not, are I'm not pessimistic about me compromising. <laughs> I'm a rhino, man. I'm a rhino. But that Come on. is a kind of a demo that has a democratic flavor. I think if we sat down at a table, Georgetown can solve everything. That actually <laughs> would probably be acceptable. That might come to the where point. that line yeah. is, is what you would end up arguing about. But once you're arguing about the details, let me, let me, let me tell you the, the ads system. that are coming. <laughs> coming We're taking away right. student, oh, <laughs> middle yeah, class students are losing, their, are losing their student loans. And that's why we couldn't Evil Tim Miller and Harry yeah. Reid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so great. Don't pick on Harry Reid. Miller, <laughs> Miller Economics, you heard it first. Yeah. <laughs> Get excited. Sorry, man. Michael Steele. Um, among millennials, how does economic literacy compare to other generations, either statistically or anecdotally, and then how does that play in at all with skepticism of institutions and government? That's an interesting question. Yeah. I am not sure. I, know, I would say probably everyone's, I would say that broad economic literacy is probably, we do not have widespread economic literacy. That's what I would say. I'm going to turn to Steve though, because I'm not sure that we really got at that concept directly. And, you know, people tend, they see what, they see, they mm. see what happens when they wake up, when they go to school, when they go to the store, when they, and that's different than kind of saying, hey, we're in recovery. And understanding what recovery is, what interest rates are, what's worth borrowing, what's not worth borrowing. Oh, so we didn't ask about this in the poll, but, but there was a, I think a surprising statistic in the poll, which sort of talks to this broader issues, which how much do millennials understand the impact of what's happening now in their lives? If you ask them to rank issues where they thought the federal government ought to be engaged in terms of public policy, number one was education. That's probably not surprising. Mm -hmm. Number two, which was surprising to me at least, was social security and, uh, and retirement. That was their number two most important issue because they are already looking 30, 40 years down the road. And they're seeing a situation where they're gonna to have to work longer. There's no doubt that ultimately, our, to fix our social security system in my view, people are gonna to have to work longer. Mm -hmm. We're gonna to have to maybe means test social security down the road. They're gonna to have to live on these wages that are below where they've been in, in past generations for a lot longer. And that makes them very concerned. They wanna see more investments in retirement. And that, to me, demonstrates some amount of, of understanding what's happening in the broader system. And again, I think it's another way we, we as a kind of DC or as the parties patronize millennials. We think that they're not thinking about bigger issues that are affecting the country, and they clearly are. You asked them about the number three issue was national security. And this is across the board. This isn't just Democratic millennials who are focused on retirement security. This is all millennials. This wasn't just Republican millennials fo focused on national security. This was all millennials. So the big, millennials care about the bigger issues. They're in touch with the bigger challenges in the country, but it starts from their own personal experience. And in their own personal experience, they're not seeing the jobs that pay the type of wages they need. And I, you know, Simone, you talk about this, I think, very effectively. Ultimately, that's what everyone cares about, whether you're a millennial or anyone else. You care about that issue. You yeah. care about the jobs. And I, I also think you have to look at the intersectionality of millennials. I think a lot of times when the media, and I'll lump myself in with the media because I sit on television and talk about millennials and people all day long, but we paint with a broad stroke brush and we don't look at the intersectionality of, you know, the difference between what white millennials care about in, in, in terms of what is the economic literacy of white millennials, of African American millennials, of Latino millennials. I think that matters. And I think, I, I read it in the New York Times, there's a study that talked about it would take 228 years for an African American family to catch up to the wealth of an average white family. And that's important when we talk about economic literacy. And we go back to talking about the wealth gap, and we go back to talking about um, the disparities, not just in terms of middle class and poor, but black middle class, Latino middle class, Native American middle class, white middle class, all those things matter. And there are large gaps when you go to break down these millennial um, demographics and segments, I think, especially when it comes to the money piece. I mean, people throw out the statistic about equal pay, for example, and uh, women earn 79 cents for every dollar a man makes. No, white women earn 79 cents for every dollar a man makes. African American women earn 64 cents, and Latino women earn 50, not 54 cents, 59 cents for every dollar a white man makes. That's a disparity that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Is there another question? Um, so throughout the campaign, there have been many instances of maybe perhaps the candidates attempting to reach out to millennials in ways that have been seen as highly patronizing. 
uh, i.e. like reacting to policy proposals via emoji. So um, do you think that the fact that millennials commonly view candidates as out of touch has had an impact on the race? And if so, what approach should the candidates have taken to reach out to millennials without being condescending? As somebody who's sent an emoji from a candidate, I'll probably feel that one first. Um, uh, I'm giving you a winky face right now. Um, you know, it's hard. I, look, I think that, um, the, the, you know, this is cliche, I guess, at this point, but, you know, I think that young people expect um, an authenticity from, their can from people in public life that is greater than what people did in, in, in older generations. Um, and uh, sometimes that creates some tough tensions with you know, political campaigns and political candidates who are from a different, who are, who are from a different generation to try to ex be authentic and try to express themselves authentically online. Um, it's easy to mock, right? It's, it's, e it's easily mockable. And I think that honestly the candidates that do this the best are the ones who uh, are often, not always, are often the ones who kind of manage their own, you know, online presence themselves. You know, I mean, say what you want about Corey. Exception of Booker. Donald Trump, not uh, Donald Trump. Well, look, okay, hey, no, say what you want about Donald. He's authentic, <laughs> right? I yeah. think people people do feel like they're they're getting they're the real getting the deal. Real I mean, he's authentically despicable, <laughs> right? But I, I actually think that his That's social funny. media presence is much more millennial-ish than, than anybody else who ran on our side. You know, and and there are huge risks that go with this, right? No, Marco like tried this for a week, my pal Marco, but he, he spent a week like where he took over his own Twitter account and all of a sudden everybody was like, whoa, dude. Um, uh, like this was, it was a little too authentic. Um, and they gave it back to the staff, you know, but. Um, it, On the left, Anthony Weiner has been very authentic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you, it's a good question. It, increasingly though, you, you see this in ways that are, is not condescending. Like I'd point you on yeah. the right yeah. uh, uh, to Ben Sass and yeah. Justin Amash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the left, I point you to Cory Booker. They manage their own stuff for the most part, and you know sometimes it still rings false, and you can still tease them over certain things. But but they are being themselves, and I think that part of the what you are what you're referring to is, is what comes off as condescending is really just trying too hard. You know, I think it also um, has to do with. I really think that folks across the board grossly underestimated the role that millennials would play in this election way back to the primary season. I mean, millennials were a large part of the reason Bernie Sanders was still in the race for so long. And then post primary season on the Democratic side, when the millennials didn't automatically jump over into the Hillary camp, everybody was like, well, what the hell is wrong with them? So when you talk about ways, you know, campaigns engage, I think it's about understanding millennials. And now there's been so many more uh, reports and polls and all kinds of things trying to figure out who are these millennial folks and what do they care about. Uh, I, I go back to the primary season when it was, um, it was the anniversary when Rosa Parks sat on the back of the bus and the Clinton campaign changed their logo, the H logo, um, to Rosa Parks and the H, but Rosa Parks was at the back of the H. So everybody, <laughs> she was at the back of the H. And everybody um, in our camp, I was like, what is this? Who did this? And our digital team was like, I think they're trying to be innovative. I'm like, it's working, but let me tell y'all, Black Twitter is not going to be here for Rosa Parks <laughs> at the back of the H. And they weren't. And the H was gone before the end of the day because so many people had noted how this was condescending. This wasn't a great way to reach out. So representation. Did you see Hillary chilling in Cedar Rapids? I, I, I miss that. You have to see that one. That's really good. I will have to she Google did a, this. She did a vine, a selfie vine, where she talked about how she's chilling in Cedar Rapids. It's hilarious. <laughs> or that she has hot sauce in her bag, hilarious. you know? So these are all, which she really does carry hot sauce in her purse, though. But in her, her defense, you guys have been to Cedar Rapids, right? There's literally nothing to do there. So. <laughs> she really what was else chilling. would she be doing? Chilling in Cedar Rapids. So I think uh, understanding millennials makes a difference. I mean, people are trying to that point, but I think representation on your staff matters, knowing not to put Rosa at the back of the H. And then um, just <laughs> really thinking about and employing authentic ways to engage millennial aud audiences. I am a proponent of these things called millennial conversations, where you get in a room like this with young people and you have an actual conversation with young people. And I feel like if more candidates did that, um, they, their real personalities, well, some of them, like Donald Trump, we don't want their personalities to show through, <laughs> but some other people um, should get in the room and do those kind of things because then it gives you a chance to authentically engage. Uh, folks get to ask you questions. You get to bring your platform right to people. And I think, again, going Going back to what millennials really care about, I mean, they care about the real issues and they want real people to really engage with them.
Yeah, and it's risky, but it's but it's very risky. It's but risky. that's why you control the room and yeah. plant the question. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're getting all the good things. Yep. Yeah. Oh here, oh here, you this. Yeah. Um, my name's Joshua. I'm a millennial. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm so sad to. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that's been top of my mind in the, you know, during this panel and in the long, long months of this campaign is probably how much better things would be if a millennial was running for office, was in that position, was in Congress. So I think campaigns, uh, making that kind of outreach like Bernie Sanders did uh, this year is one step, but what else can government actors, non-state actors do to encourage millennial public service so that they can represent themselves? I think people, to encourage, I think that's a great question, to encourage millennial public service. One, I think young people need to know that they can run and put their names on the ballot and it's not going to cost them three arms and two legs um, to do so. And that's when we have to talk about campaign finance reform. In most places, like, people don't even know. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, and in order to run for city council in Omaha, you need to be able to at least raise $75,000 with name recognition, without name recognition, you need to be able to raise $125,000. If you are a regular young person that just really cares about your community, you don't have that kind of money. And you don't even know where to go get it. So I, uh, I think it's those programs. I think the Republican Party has done a good job at building the bench. Mm -hmm. And they have young people that they can point to um, that have served in city councils and state legislators, as county controllers that have had that experience in the Democratic Party, we have not done a great job of building our bench and building a diverse bench. So when it's time to, you know, like, where are the, where are the black women? Where are the young Latino women? Where are the young Latino men? We need to go out and find them. And I think a best way to do that is we have to do some hunting and let people know, tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, you too can run for office. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting, and especially, you know, there's a lot of studies Price Cooper and a bunch of these firms have done about getting, encouraging more participation. And for risk adverse people, whether it be millennials that are full of angst or, or women or people of color, a lot of, a lot of people needed to be asked three times by people that they cared about before they ran, right? And that, and so it's, it's one of the greatest things of, of a younger generation having social media, it's contagious and it spreads, right? And so whether you get involved by voting or like everybody on this board is, you know, on this panel have all served um, presidents or presidential hopefuls. So I think it's really, it's, it's incredibly interesting um, just by your own example. I mean, I think one yeah. thing that is not well understood is that, you know, kind of working, at least in my experience for Congress, it's one of the fastest ways to accelerate your career because everyone cycles out, so there's always room above you, right? So it's, you get promotions much more quickly. It's one of the closest things to a meritocracy that I've ever worked in. You work hard, you do well. Someone above you is getting promoted or going to a campaign or going to the White House. There's room above you that you don't find in corporate America that you might not find if you're in a startup because you've got to keep doing it. I've found government service to be exceptionally um, you know, beneficial to my career. And I think if more people understood that you just go in there and you pay your dues for five or 10 or even two years, and then you're there, then you're contributing, then you're helping. It actually does make a difference and it's, it's um, kind of a win-win. And I think we should talk about that more mm -hmm. actually. And I, I, I would give, I, I agree with what Kathy said. I worked on, on the Hill, um, although I don't know if I'd, I'd be quick to go back to the Hill for some of the reasons Tim mentioned, but where, <laughs> what's impressed me the most is what's happening in some of the local gover governments around the country. Mm -hmm. Some of the coolest things are, are happening because of really innovative mayors mm -hmm. and cities across the country. These are not all big cities. Uh, there's a friend of mine, Pete Buttigieg, in, uh, he's a very hard to pronounce the name, mm -hmm. who's the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Really impressive, a young guy who's found ways to integrate technology in the basic running of a local government. There are really creative things happening at the local level all over the country, and they are desperately in need of good people. I would say go home. Mm -hmm. Spend your time at Georgetown and go somewhere else in the country that desperately needs young leaders to turn those cities around. Find a partners in the private sector and start turning those communities around. We travel all around the country seeing um, what's happening at the local level. And there are some amazing things happening, both, and it's entrepreneurial, just like running a company is entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. Trying to figure out how to run a city or a, a town council or a, or a county commissioner's office, there's something very entrepreneurial about what's happening at the local level, and you don't deal with the same kind of political 
uh, nonsense as you do in DC because people are there to solve problems and there's some interesting things going and the communities need it mm -hmm. desperately. So I would say go home mm -hmm. to where you're from, spend some time there and come back to DC after you're done. I agree with that. Great advice, yeah. great advice. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, front row. Yeah. Oh, wearing a Hoya man <laughs> Hi guys. Uh, this question is mainly for Tim. Um, Uh-oh. As, as, no, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> as, as, as a millennial conservative, I was, uh, deeply, dis <laughs> I was deeply discouraged by the, uh, the primary process. Yeah. Uh, I was originally a Carly supporter because I thought she had the best uh, uh, policy-focused campaign. You weren't worried about her face? <laughs> no, I do not. I'm like, you weren't worried about that? Was, no, was that no. inhibitor? No. <laughs> uh, but then she dropped out, and uh, I became a Marco supporter because I thought uh, he did the best job of trying to champion everybody. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I was mostly concerned about uh, a lot of the divisive messages, uh, especially brought about by our party's candidate. Uh, and, but eventually, whenever, these, you know, whenever Donald Trump is gone and uh, you know, the older conservatives you know, pass away and are long gone, uh, the, the conservative party is going to be handed down to millennials. And, He's uh, talking about you when he refers <laughs> to yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily. You uh, die. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, and so my question is, uh, what, what, can, what can millennials do to, or millennial conservatives do to rebuild the Republican Party uh, in a way that champions everybody and is not so divisive, so that way, we, that way we can win national elections and not become a regional party? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. If I knew the answer, uh, I'd be doing it. I worked on that, uh, that autopsy that you talked about <laughs> a little while ago that nobody listened to. Um, so I think that everything that's in there is still true. Um, nothing changed really four years later except for that we kind of went completely the opposite direction. Uh, the cliche answer to your question is that like, we need young people to get involved. Uh, the biggest problem is you go to a Republican Party event and it's all old white dudes. It's all old white dudes. Like, if you look around at this event here, you know, besides being young, it's also a very diverse audience. And uh, there are only a few, and I give credit to the guys that are doing it and the women that are doing it, Republicans who are out there actually going out and trying to speak to young voters and speak to in minority communities. We're never going to be able to win with just white guys anymore. It doesn't work. The math doesn't work. Uh, and besides it not being the right thing to do. Um, so, you know, look, I, I think that we need um, to have an infusion of, of younger voters, of suburban voters, of diverse voters to participate in the Republican primary process. In 2020, there will be no Democratic primary. Um, and the big problem is all of the same, if, if, if new people don't come into the process, if we don't recruit new people into the process, the same voters that elected Donald Trump are going to be the voters that vote again in four years. It's not like it's going to magically change and get better. And all of a sudden, those, they're going to be like, hey, we're going to go with Marco this time. Uh, you know, I mean, Marco only got 15% of the vote the, the, this last election. So uh, we need to uh, get new people into the party. It's going to be a lot harder uh, than it looks. But you know, the biggest thing I would do is, is, um, is nothing uh, is going to change if we don't go and recruit people to become, to become involved in it. And uh, I'm not optimistic that it's going to change by 2020, but I'm um, hopeful that it, that it won't be too long after that. But uh, we, you know, we need to start this process in, in 2020. And uh, I, I'm, I think that next time, hopefully, um, we will learn our lesson from this and not have quite as much R on our crime um, <laughs> among the people who aren't insane. <laughs> That's so great, and we hope to see you on the ballot. Okay, um, so we're going to wrap this up, and I just want to have our panel leave you guys with advice. Okay, so what is one optimistic message to transform generation angst into generation opportunity? Okay, how do we, how do, if there is one piece of advice, I, I loved your advice, go home. So, I mean, that, that's a pretty... I mean, like, yeah. right now, go, go home. <laughs> just go. It's usually go to the tombs, but yeah, no. Well, I, I, I'm now 15 years out of Georgetown, and uh, I still have close to $70,000 in student loan debt, which I'm paying off very slowly because the interest rates were very low when I got them. Yeah. But I would just say take risk. I mean, you guys are among the most privileged millennials in the country, period. And I'm not going to say what comes with great privilege comes with great responsibility, because, although I love Spider-Man. <laughs> you have, you, you have a, a mandate to go out and do something creative, to, to you know, kind of break a few ceilings and to, to push the envelope a little bit. That's both politically, that may be back at home or here, 
let's start something new where EIG is a, a big proponent of the need for entrepreneurship in this country. Start a business, do something creative, get out there, take some risk. It will be okay. Everyone in this room is going to be okay. That's not true about millennials everywhere in this country where some are, have multiple jobs, they have kids they're trying to support, they're in single family households. You guys, for the most part, as a group, have no excuse. So take some risk. It will be okay. You're going to have debt your whole life. It's just, you know, it's part of being American. Get out there and, and, take, and take some risk. Use this opportunity you have here at Georgetown to do that. And so my message would be, if, if you really feel you can't do that, we, you know, in the survey, 44% of the respondents said, you know, I, I think I'm going to climb the corporate ladder because, you know, they're risk averse and they want to do that. But I would say there's a slice of optimism in that too because employers are increasingly kind of moving toward the millennial generation. There's big opportunities to be kind of entrepreneur within a firm, which is like, that's my firm. We do that. Everybody kind of, if you can start up your own business inside, you can have a desk and a phone. So there's a lot of employers who want the entrepreneurial spirit and the independence that this generation has. And this generation is really hardworking, they'll do what it takes, they'll move, they'll commute, all kinds of stuff, and people know that. So even if you do get into a company, if that's kind of what you need to do, break, break doors, break windows, break whatever it is you're supposed to break, because employers will, employers love entrepreneur, entrepreneurs inside the, inside the building. Literally so they, tear this building down on the way out. <laughs> tear it out. Tear but it down. Everybody's looking for entrepreneurs in yeah. every structure. Mm -hmm. Tim? Yeah, I agree with that. Look, um, I, I, my company is all millennials. Like, I think we have two people who work at the company that aren't millennials. Um, and you know, we've grown to like 90 people. And there's huge opportunity here in, in DC. So I, I mean, I think that while you're here, the biggest thing that I noticed with all of them is that, is that um, uh, you know, there is a, you know, kind of like barrier to, you know, going to communicate and going to ask for help and, and you know, going to, um, uh, uh, you know, try to push, push themselves to go, to go do something. I, I, like the, D, the opportunities in D.C. are not like El Paso, Texas, right? I mean, like thanks to the inexorable growth of government. Uh, DC is going fantastic, um, and so while I while I agree with uh, you're sounding more like a Democrat every day. Yeah. Uh, while I agree with the advice to go home, while you're here, um, uh, you know I think that you should not be shy about reaching out to people and asking for advice and asking and, and giving your ideas because um, you know there's tons of opportunity to do that, and I think that a lot of the um, people that work at our firm are, are having a great time, but my advice to all them would be is, is you're putting ceilings on yourself by not trying to, uh, by not going out there and doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say be a doer, and uh, that's, that's frankly what I've done. I've gone out and I've been a doer. So I do think that DC um, provides a wealth of opportunity to think and ask questions, but it also provides a wealth of opportunity to, to create and to actually go do. So if you're disillusioned with the Republican Party and how the elections were divisive and they haven't necessarily reached out to young people, I'm pretty sure the top Republicans would definitely love you and a bunch of other Republican, young Republicans to say, we want to do a Republican millennial com conversation about how we can move things forward. We want to write a letter, have a press conference. The press will come and cover it. Let me, I'll send some people actually. <laughs> because I think that is what we need to do. Young people are leading every single movement, regardless Democrat or Republican, they're leading these movements from the LGBTQ movement to the Black Lives Matter movement to climate to the economy. The reason we're in this room today, we are leading these conversations and it is up to us to get in the game, get engaged and get involved. We don't have to wait for someone to tap us, tap us on our shoulder. You know, I didn't, people told me I, I could be a press assistant this um, election cycle and maybe one day I'd be, get to be a national press secretary. And there's some people that I'm just <laughs> flipping my imaginary hair at right now. <laughs> so be a doer and there's no excuse to C's point not to be a doer. Actually, it is your responsibility to go and be a doer. So get your schoolwork done, then go out and be and do. I love it. That's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much for your curiosity. Thanks for a great panel. Appreciate it. Thank you.